Okay, kids, it's your turn. Okay, we're going to do something just a little bit different today so that the Zoomers can see you, okay? So all the kids, if you could come up here, make a line. Awesome. Yay! <laughs> How are you guys doing? Two thumbs up, one thumb up, one side, sort of. Okay. Is a little early still? Kind of okay? Yeah? Oh, you even have a foot up. It's a really good day for you, Max. Okay. That's good to hear. Uh, has anyone been making that rock pathway at home? No? We, I, I'm the one that's ended up doing it at my house. <laughs> Um, we need one of the older kids. Christiane, do you think you could come and light the candle in the front here? So around the front here. So we made these Lent in a bag rock pathways. Do you know how to use those? Let's see. I don't know if it's locked. Oh yeah, this is good. So this was our Lent in a bag activity to lay out 40 rocks and six Seashells, thank you so much. Great. Or um, little jewel things. And at the end, we get to light a candle for Easter Sunday. Thank you. The other thing we did way back at the beginning of March, the very first Sunday of Lent, does anyone remember what we buried? We made a paper craft, we wrote a word inside, and we folded it up and covered it up. Hallelujah. Yes. You guys didn't know you were getting tested this morning, did you? Does anyone remember what hallelujah means? Do you remember what language it is? Hallelujah is the first part of the word, right? And the second part of the word is yah, right? So hallelujah is Hebrew for praise, and yah is like a short form for Yahweh, for God. That was the, the um, ancient Hebrews special name for God was Yahweh. So hallelujah, yeah. <laughs> and then we have, but we also have alleluia without the H. Hallelujah and alleluia. And alleluia is just the Greek or Latin. It's the same thing as hallelujah, okay? So today, because we buried it at the beginning of Lent, because Lent is sort of like a, a, a sad, solemn time where we know that we're walking toward Good Friday, which is the very, very, very sad day right, 2,000 years ago that Jesus died. So we, we mark that time by, um, sometimes in churches they don't say the word hallelujah or alleluia, or they don't sing songs with those words in it during Lent. But then on Easter Sunday, we can say it again. So we're going to raise the alleluia today. So I need Max, because you have, you know, so many thumbs and feet up. Maybe we'll get one more foot up if you do this. <laughs> So underneath there, there's something hiding under the communion table. Can you go grab it? All right, hold it up nice and high. What does it say? Alleluia. Alleluia. Great, great. Okay, so what we're going to do in order to raise the Alleluia back to life is we're going to say it three times because we worship a God who's three in one, right? Father, Spirit, Son. So what I'm going to get you to do is the first time we say it, you're going to hold it down here, nice and low, and we're going to whisper Alleluia, okay? Then you can hold it like here, and then we'll say Alleluia with our normal voice. Then you're going to hold it way up high, and what, what do you think we should do then? Yes, not scream as in a screechy scream, <laughs> but a joyful shout, right? Does the Bible say, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, right? So a joyful shout, okay? All right, so we'll, let's, we'll practice just us kids, and we'll see who can do it louder, just us kids or everyone together, okay? Okay, just us kids first. Okay, so down low. Alleluia. 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 Whoa, that was pretty good. I don't know. I don't know if the adults can beat that. What do you guys think? Okay, let's see. Let's see if we can do it. Okay, down nice and low. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Nice. Thank you so much for your help. Okay. You can go back to your seat and do your activity at your seat. And we, we're going to sing Alleluia together. So I invite you to stand and sing this song with us. everyone. He is, he is risen. Oh, we're getting so good at this. Every year it gets better. <laughs> oh, friends, welcome to the road uh, church this morning. My name is Jackie. I'm one of the pastors here. Just so you know, if you, ha you haven't seen Rich in, two in a Good Friday or today, Rich has had the COVIDs and he is at home and he's joining us on Zoom. So everyone can say hi to Rich. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> He's missing out, and as always, we miss him. Uh, but yeah, that's where Rich is, if you were wondering <laughs> where he's been. Um, but it is very good to see you all, and it's very good to be together. And it's good, uh, this is the first Sunday in a few years. So we've been here. Um, some of us have masks on, some of us don't, and that is all good. We know how we are in this space. We treat each other, and we treat each other with the best possible respect we can. Um, but it is good to be together, and it is good to be able to add our, our flower, which kind of represents our bit of life, our hopes, to this cross and see it raised up, and this is all very good. But here's where I want to start today. Because in our Easter story, it always starts like this. Early in the morning, while it was still dark. This is how our resurrection story begins. It's how every story of God with us begins. The story always starts with God loving and acting and creating and redeeming, even in the dark. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. And she was going there to attend the body, to mourn privately. I think she was going to that last place where she knew Jesus had existed in tangible form. And she went to the tomb and she saw it was open. The tomb was open and she came running to Simon and to John, and she said in this, in this panic, they've taken the Lord out of the tomb and we don't know where they have put him. And I, 
It's good for me to imagine, because I think we come into this Sunday with a bit of excitement, but for her in this moment, it's still dark. It's still early. And this is an excitement. This is maybe a bit of, of fear, of horror. This is a final indignity to someone who meant everything to her. She doesn't know. Someone has taken the body. And when Peter and John hear this, they too are shocked, and they start to run to the tomb, and both are running, the text says, but John outruns Peter, and he reaches the tomb first, and he bends over, and he looks in, and he sees the strips of linen lying there, but he doesn't go in. And then Simon Peter comes up slower, but <laughs> maybe a little bit more headlong, and he goes straight into the tomb, and he sees the strips of linen too. And finally, John goes inside, and the text says that he saw and he believed. They didn't but they still didn't understand. They didn't understand, but they believed. And I think it's important for me to remember, so maybe it's important for us to remember that when it says they believed in the text, it doesn't mean they intellectually understood anything. It doesn't mean they mentally assented to a list of beliefs that made them Christians. It doesn't mean they had this fancy atonement theory to agree to. The word for believe here, it always means to trust to entrust, to entrust themselves. They had no idea what was going on, but they entrusted themselves to this mystery, to this thing that had happened while it was still dark. And then they went back home. But Mary stayed. Mary stood outside the tomb saying, crying. And as she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and she saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. And these angels asked her, woman, why are you crying? Well, they've taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. And at this, she turned around and she saw Jesus standing there behind her, not in the tomb, but in the garden. But she didn't realize it was Jesus. And he asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, just tell me where you've put him and I will go get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary, and she turned towards him. And she cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. And from there, she ran back to the rest of the disciples, Jesus' other friends. And Mary went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. And maybe they entrusted themselves a little bit more to this mystery. And then that evening, on the first day of the week, when the disciples had still gathered together, the doors were still locked for fear of the Jewish leaders. Jesus came and he stood among them and he said, peace be with you. And after this, he showed them his, his hands and his side. It wasn't a dream. They hadn't made it all up. He was not a mirage. It was real life with consequences and real life with scars. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. And again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, just as he sent me to love and to heal and to preach the good news and to change the way people are seeing God and seeing themselves, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. These are all scenes from John 20. And the thing about these scenes is that they're also human. The reactions of everyone involved are so true. There's this very real grief and very real loss and very real confusion, doubt, maybe a bit of panic. And then there's also this very real wonder and a very real joy and maybe real trust. All of this humanness are, is in this resurrection scenes and all of our humanness is in these resurrection scenes. And yet these scenes are even bigger than our humanness because they make up this big cosmic hope that darkness is not a time of nothing, but a time when God is most at work. Whether it's the darkness of a womb or the darkness of a tomb, God is at work. Our greatest hope is that death is not something to be feared, but that life comes anew from death every time. And that the creator of the cosmos in solidarity in offering himself with this beloved creation comes to his friends and stands among them and says, peace, peace. These scenes potently embody a hope in which the end word is not judgment, and it's not wrath, and it's not work, and it's not toil, and it's not more effort, and it's not perfecting yourself, but it is love that chooses to open itself up and fall to the ground and be buried in the dark 
and become new life. This is resurrection life, and this is the story we live out of. Now, the thing with this claim of resurrection is that we cannot divorce the ends from the means. We cannot divorce this good news that there is new life from the way it came. This new life did not come to us with force or with power or a threat or by cursing or by our capacity to make others do good. It did come by art smarting our own natures. This new life came by falling to the ground in defeat, in powerlessness offering its full self. James Cone is one of the most powerful theologians of the 20th century, and he wrote, the cross is a paradoxical religious symbol because it inverts the world's value system with the news that hope comes by way of defeat, that suffering and death do not have the last word, and that the last shall be first and the first last. And what I keep coming back to in these scenes in John 20 is that the action is happening while it's still dark for Mary and for Peter and for us. While it's still night and we are incapable of making life happen, making light happen while we are dead, God does the work by giving himself unto death. The power over death doesn't come from force. It doesn't come from will, but from giving up power. This says everything to me about the way God works and what might possibly be the best news about this good news. We will always attempt to make ourselves and each other our best selves. That's not a bad thing in and of itself. We have this agency in the world, and yet we keep, I keep doing this, we mistake our capacity to join in with God for this deceit or a conceit that we are gods and can impose our will on others for the sake of, of power, which I think in the end is always for the sake of trying to cheat death. Every culture, every human system does this. A version of this, our culture, is one of self-optimization and severe individualism, where we punish those, maybe economically, maybe socially, who cannot optimize themselves. And we will always demand a performance from others and ourselves that we will not be able to fulfill. And we hurt each other out of our own hurt and fear. We demand a perfection, and in our deep anxieties, we have demanded a perfection from ourselves that leads to shame, where we have believed a lie that our own selves and our own neighbors are the enemy and not the beloved. We've demanded a, per a perfection from ourselves and from others that we cannot get to. We'll never be free until we are dead to this whole business of justifying ourselves, perfecting ourselves. I heard that phrase in a commentary about all this church abuse that keeps coming to the light in the news recently, all this um, abuse and wrongdoing that's, that's happened in a, in a power-soaked church culture. We will never be free until we are dead to this whole business of justifying ourselves. We won't be free until we let that whole power thing die and we experience that powerlessness that we are called to live into because it's there. It's there that something else can happen even in the dark. And even if we don't understand it, there might be a place where we are given an invitation to trust it. They did not understand, but they believed. While it was still dark, the love that created the universe did the work of bringing a whole new way of being. It's a mystery, but it's a good one. It's a mystery, but a good one that calls us to trust that when we stop trying so hard, when we finally let ourselves grieve, when we finally says, say, this hurts, I can't do anything to solve it, I can't make it right, I can't control the outcomes, it's then that healing comes. I think about Mary at her rock bottom, walking to that tomb in the dark that morning. Where does she go from here? She has not a lot of options. No one will welcome her and take her seriously like Jesus did. I think about Peter at his rock bottom on that morning, knowing his deepest weakness that his bold talk just masked a fear, and now he was just shown to be this scared boy who betrayed at the first scary moment. He knows he can't fix that. He knows he can't go back in time. Where does he go from here? And of course, I think about us. I think about our world. I think about our times, and we live in shadow. Um, I was thinking about this phrase, the world is always ending somewhere, and that's not a quip, but it is kind of a horrifying truth. I bet we could take two minutes and make a list as long as I am tall 
of all the ways the world is in shadow and getting seemingly darker right now. Right? We have, we have the news about Ukraine. The still six million Syrians in refugee camps in countries that can't afford them and can't care for them. I, was, I do a bit of uh, research for the justice part of the denomination and I came across the fact that there is 90 million displaced people around the world right now, displaced from war or famine or the results of climate change. Like the world is ending <laughs> everywhere. And we hear all these news stories and there's incredible levels of anxiety and there's depression even in our own homes and our own places. We've placed so much pressure. Uh, I could go on, I, and I have lists, but I don't even want to attend to those things, but they're still there, and it's still real. We are still sick. The connective tissue between us and our neighbors is not, is not there as much as it was. Maybe it wasn't there. Maybe we just thought it was there, and then this pandemic has shown some things. But this is our world, and it is still in the dark. There are things we do not have capacity to make right. And yet... This is the mystery, and it is a good one, that while it is still dark, the love that created the universe did the work. And this is the mystery that we keep on preaching, and it's silly, and it's mockable, and maybe it doesn't make sense, and yet it still keeps bringing us life. When we are not awake and not aware and not capable, we entrust our lives to the truth that God is on the move. Life is being restored to places and times and communities and peoples and individual hearts that we thought were dead. God is breathing on us and calling to us and moving us to trust, moving us to love, moving us to forgive and to see the world in a new way and to join in with him. I love the image we get in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe and I have a joke in here about how it's not an resurrection sermon until someone references C.S. Lewis. <laughs> but the story is still so powerful. Because we have this, if you're familiar with the story, the lion and the witch in the wardrobe, there's this white witch. And in her quest for power in Narnia and control, she, she freezes anyone who gets in her way. She turns them to stone with her magic. But when her power is defeated on the stone table, not by war, but by an offering, by a free offering of death. When her power is defeated, the deeper magic starts at work, and even in the dark, Aslan goes to retrieve his people, his loved ones, the Narnians who are stuck in the witch's castle where their stone bodies have been turned to stone and they're just kept there, they're incapacitated, and it's there that he brings them back to life with his big liony breath. C.S. Lewis wrote, I expect you've seen someone put a lighted match to a bit of newspaper which is propped up in a grate against an unlit fire. For a second, nothing seems to have happened, but then you notice a tiny streak of flame creeping along the edge of the newspaper. It was like that now. For a second, after Aslan had breathed upon him, the stone lion looked just the same. But then a tiny streak of gold began to run along his white marble back and then it spread. And then the color seemed to lick all over him as the flame licks over every bit of paper. And then while his hind quarters were still obviously stoned, the lion shook his mane and all the heavy stony folds rippled into living hair. And then he opened a great red mouth warm and living and gave a prodigious yawn. And now his hind legs had come to life and he lifted one of them and scratched himself and then, having caught sight of Aslan, he went bounding after him and frisking around him, whimpering with delight and jumping up to lick his face. While in the dark, God is at work, on the move, and the work of resurrection emerges and ignites and takes over like fire licking up paper. This whole Christian thing with God is not about us and our capacity. The Narnians didn't unstone themselves. They did not breathe life back into themselves. This Christian resurrection life will find a way to crack open through that brutality we impose on each other, on ourselves, and it silences it. It rebukes those ways of the world that shame and brutalize and hoard and tell us that it's for our own good. This story, the, where the means is the message, it ends not with our enemies defeated, whether those enemies are outside of us or inside of us, but it ends where our enemies 
the tax collectors or the outcasts or the addicts or the selfish or the mean or the very righteous or the proud or the thieves on crosses are loved back into the circle. And I need to hear that because I both stand in judgment of them and I also am them. This story where the means is the message is that the God who is love, who embraces powerlessness for the sake of creation, he truly sees us in our grief at the bottom, not capable of making anything happen. This God knows our name, and in that place, that God calls to us, maybe laughs at our incredulity a bit, invites us to touch his wounds, and trusts us enough to trust in him. And he draws us into this place where we can hope again forgiven, made new, born again. I think any wisdom that the Christian life has and the Christian faith has comes from living here, where it's not about self-optimization or success or goals. It is about seeing truly the ways of God in the dark and being truly seen by God even in the dark. This faith is about a whole new way of life, and we get to be a part of it, and we don't have to go back (laughs) What don't you have to go back to? My friend Aletha asked me this question this week. What shame don't you have to go back to? What fear don't you have to go back to? What attempt at perfecting yourself do you not have to go back to? What is loosed and given room to grow in the soil when forgiveness is at the core of a life? What is loosed and given room to grow when a loving father says, you, I thought you were dead, that you've come back and we need to celebrate that. What is loosed and given room to grow when you don't have to strive anymore, when you can admit the truth about yourself because God has come to that place, to that place that you want to keep hidden, and he has redeemed it. Early in the morning, while it was still dark, God gave us new eyes to see. And while it was still dark, God did the work of dying and bringing new life that catches us up in its wake. While it is still dark, the enemy's love of shame that still does a number on us, that shame was defeated and was shown to not work because shame does not work to bring about God's good. It doesn't. And while it was still dark, we were still afraid and we were maybe locked away. God brought light into places. And while it was still dark, Jesus rose from the dead and made the tomb a womb. And this is strange and it's cosmic and it's so human and it's a mystery. And when we try to explain it, we're going to falter. If we try to explain it too much, we're going to get way too literal, make a bunch of systems and formulas out of it. It just doesn't help. But when we hold it as a mystery, we can start to sense its truth and we can start to live into it. And this is resurrection life. We don't need to understand it or define it. We are are invited to trust it, to entrust ourselves to it, and live in a new way because of it, because it's good news. Even in the dark, nothing's going to stop that resurrection life. And then the best news of all is that in the process, in the process of God doing all that work in the dark, he's going to call each of our names. And we will know, we will see, our eyes will be open to the God who sees us. Right? He said, Mary, Peter, Wendy, Nicole, right? Jeff, Heather, Aletha. I, I, do you want me to do everyone? I would. <laughs> I would if we had time. <laughs> Imagine what it was like. Imagine him saying your name. This is the best news. Where it's dark out there, God is at work there. God's at work in Ukraine. There is resurrection life happening there. In those refugee camps, God is at work there. We have to, and we do trust that. In all the opioid deaths, God is at work there. It's not the end. The despair is not the final answer. I'm not sure how that all works, but I'm trusting it. And I'm going to live into it, and I'm called to help live into that. We're stark in here. God's at work here, too. We are resurrection people, and we don't have to be afraid to let things go. God brings life, and he calls our name, and everything is different, even while it's still dark. Amen? He is risen. Oh, I like it. (laughs) Okay, I'm going to pray. Oh, God, I don't understand. I don't feel it. And yet when we gather and we kind of stake this claim in the ground and say, nope, we believe there is resurrection life, even in the dark, 
it has to be this way. I've seen it in bits and in glimpses in my own life. I've seen it in bits and glimpses in other people's lives. I've seen it writ large in the healing of people, in the restoration and forgiveness. I know wherever I see peace and wherever I see gentleness, wherever I see faithfulness and goodness, I know that it is at work. Thank you, God, we get to be a part of this. Thank you that we can bring our bit of life to the cross and trust that it's going to be raised up. And thank you that we can come together today. Um, thank you. You see us through the night. In your very good name. Amen. I'm going to invite uh, the team up, and we're going to listen to a song. The words will be on the, the screen. Um, you can just listen. Uh, and then we will have our time of communion.
<laughs> I just want to say, come on. You're so good. <laughs> oh, friends. Let's make these tombs into flower beds. This is the communion table. And the communion table comes from the story of the Last Supper. So the supper that happened right before Jesus died. But that's not the only table that Jesus presided over. I imagine that even while he broke the bread and he passed out the wine, he had in mind all the tables he had been at. And I imagine his friends had those in mind too. The table he had fed his friends at. The tables he had flipped when they got in the way of people coming to God in the temple. The tables he got down underneath to wash his friends' feet. The tables he celebrated and he made more wine at weddings at. The tables he was anointed at by women who had been scorned. The table that holds the, holds the banquet of the bride and the lamb. And Jesus told this story of a table, and I'm telling it really quickly as we enter our communion time on this Easter Sunday. Because it's that this, these are the tables he's inviting us to serve with him at. And this is a story of the new and the true and the great reversal. Jesus, after he was asked about who should be honored at his table, he told his friends to invite the least of the people to his table, always. He told them to invite the poor and the lame and the crippled. Those are who should be at my table. And then he told this story, the parable of a great banquet, a great banquet that we look forward to. And he said that in his kingdom, in his resurrection kingdom, it's like a feast where the master invites all the people you'd expect. You know, the religious people, the people who had been in the room for, for the whole time. He invites them. It's time. It's the banquet time. But they're all too busy. And they cannot make it to this table. And the master says, huh. <laughs> so he tells the servant, well, go then and quickly invite the people. Invite the people in the streets and in the alleys of this town and bring them, bring in the poor and bring in the crippled, bring in the blind, bring in the lame. And so the servant goes and he does that and then he comes back and says, sir, I've done what you've ordered, it's been done, but there is still room at this table. And then the master told his servant, well go out then to the roads, go past the city, go into the countryside and bring everyone there, compel them is the word, compel them to come in so that my house will be full. This is the whole goal, so that my house will be full. This is the table with every sort of person you can imagine. I actually was thinking every, when I said every sort, then I was thinking all sorts. And then I was thinking, oh, we should have licorice all sorts on the communion table every time. Because <laughs> all sorts are at this table. That could just be me. Yeah? <laughs> but this is the table. And God wants his table to be full. And he wants this resurrection life for this world. This resurrection life will feed us. This resurrection life will uh, make our souls glad with real bread and real wine. So we're going to celebrate this together this morning. Now, friends, when Jesus passed the bread out, when he passed the bread out, he took it and he gave thanks for it and he looked at all his friends and he said, this is my body. And he broke it. And he passed it to each of them. Everyone invited from the highways and byways, all those all sorts at the table. And he gave it to them. And then he took the wine and he poured it. I've been wanting to do it this way for a while. He really poured it. <laughs> and he gave it to them, all of them. And he said, this is the cup of the covenant in my blood. Drink it. Drink it, all of you. A broken body, a body that bleeds, the darkness was not the end, and our darkness is not the end. It's exactly where God is at work. So we're going to gather at this table together. We've been invited um, on this Resurrection Sunday. And just like you all brought your own life to the cross, and it was raised with the cross, we're all then going to come to the table this morning. We're doing it a little bit differently because uh, we're going to take those steps and come because we've been invited, all of us misfits, to this table. We're going to have two lines, just so you know. Uh, on this side is going to be juice, so maybe the families want to go there. On this side, it's going to be real wine, because I think on Easter Sunday, we can, you know, get that real wine taste in our mouths, but that's what we're going to do, and come, and maybe, I don't know if we want to go through the sides, and then we can leave, or come through up the front, Jess knows these things, up the front to the things, and then you can go back to your table, but that's how we'll do it, 
You can come as a family. You can come on your own. You can take a bit of time to consider while we listen to the music. But we are going to move our bodies and come to the table. All right, friends. When you are ready, come and take and eat and remember and believe that the body and the blood of Jesus have been given for the complete forgiveness of your sins, for the resurrection, and for the life. Amen. While you're being given it, we won't wait for everyone to have it all together. Come and meet us at the front. Okay. times can we do this on a Sunday? All right. Amen. I'm going to pass it on to Nicole and the team. I invite you to stand and sing. We're going to sing um, what we started the service with. We're just going to sing that chorus for Glorious Day two times through just to announce and to be triumphant about everything <laughs> coming together.
standing while I just go through an announcements? Is that what? Or you? Oh, yeah, let's just stay standing. Otherwise, it's up and down, up and down. Okay. So just a few announcements this morning. Um, we are still looking for a few volunteers. If you are interested, please let Jess know. But specifically, youth leaders. So youth or kids zone. If that is speaking in your heart and you just know that you can uh, serve in that area, that is so desperately needed. Um, also for video sound and setup, we're looking for people to help out in those capacities. Next Sunday is a community meal, and we'll do it, of course, as um, safely as possible. It'll be in person only, though, so there won't be um, uh, Zoom at the same time. But a home liturgy will be going home in the e news that week, so watch for that if you can't make it in person. And finally, there's going to be a Bible study starting up in May um, for four to six weeks on Galatians. So if you're interested in um, joining with that, please also let Jess know, jess at theroadchurch.ca if you want to join. So those are all the announcements this morning. All right. Thanks, Nicole. Last announcement, we have coffee and there's hot crust buns and we, we have a little bit of time so we don't have to rush out. So drink and eat and we can uh, gather and connect with each other a little bit more. But I'm going to bless us as we go. Beloved children of God, even in the dark, may you know the power of the Father and the love of the Son and the freedom of the Spirit that reveals day and night that nothing will stop this resurrection life. Amen. Amen. We were waiting with our hope, with our light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophet. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the
Jesus, take your...